Government's performance tracker is meant to measure the achievements of the administration, especially those that will otherwise be drowned by the daily political discus. The statistics paint a picture of a thriving education sector, especially at the basic level. Nonetheless, questions are being raised about the accuracy of this colorful picture. On our program today, we take a keen look at the basic education subsector, which some say is at the end of its tether. I am Kemini Amano, and today I sit with a member of Parliament's Education Committee. I want to understand how the government could be failing despite the investments into the sector as seen on the tracker. In what ways can the nation improve education for its younger generation? My guest today is Bosa South MP, who is also a deputy ranking member on Parliament's Education Committee, Dr. Clement Abbas Apak. Dr. Okay, welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you, Kemeni. The government of the day uh, boasts of improvement in enrollment at the basic level, generally in pre-tertiary um, education levels. They also boast of uh, increasing the number of elementary school children who can uh, read from 2% in, in the NDC's era to 38% uh, now. There have been a, a, there's been a 38% jump. Um, but you insist that the government of the day it's not doing as well as it's telling us. Why? Look, it, it is important to put things in perspective. Education, we know, is important. So every government, from the first republic till date, including even military regimes, have done their best to ensure that teaching and learning continues. For obvious reasons, because we know that if we are to progress as a nation, mm -hmm. Clearly, we must invest in our human capital. And to invest in human capital, invariably means that we have to invest in education. Now, we all know that basic education is the foundation yeah. as far as education is concerned. Let me give you a few figures so that you know, it helps the conversation. Mm -hmm. According to government's own statistics, we have 14,000 532 kindergartens in Ghana. Mm -hmm. For primary schools, we have 15,368. For junior high schools, we have 11,735. And for senior high schools, we have 699. This is from government's own report as given to us in parliament as part of the 2024 budget processes. Enrollments, KG, 1,327,980. For primary school, 3,408,290,000 students. For junior high schools, we have 1,448,896. Mm -hmm. And for Senior high schools, we have 1,331,219. Well and good. But you see, we also know from research work done by education sector CSOs, like the Africa Education Watch, that as we speak today, we have over 540,000 schools, I mean 54,000 schools mm -hmm. under trees, schools under trees. This is important because it then goes on to challenge the assertion that adequate provision has been made in terms of educational infrastructure at the basic level. If we have over 5,000 schools under trees, that should tell you that government is not doing as well as it says it is doing. And, we, and uh, I'll let you finish that point, but this 5,000 you mentioned, is it not an, an improvement on you know, pre-NPP era schools under tree numbers? No, it cannot be. It cannot be an improvement. I see. And the data is there to show that. 
Oh, so so what what were the figures? Again, I don't I do not have the figures of you know schools under trees under the uh, NDC era. But what are the figures compared to? Well, now? as far as we are concerned, and before we left we left government, mm. we had practically eliminated schools under trees. Mm. There was a conscious policy. In fact, incidentally, at the time, the current flag I mean running mate mm. of, of our party, uh, Professor J. Nano Pukwajima was the Minister for Education. And as far as we know, we had removed all schools under trees because there was a conscious policy. No, no, so You couldn't have removed all schools under trees. There were still reports. Well, that, that, is our, uh, that is our report as far as I know. If you have any contrary evidence, you can share that with me. I, I, again, I'm only averting your mind back to uh, re reports, uh, news media reports during that time about how there were still uh, some schools under tree, under trees. If, if, despite the efforts you say that uh, you had put in place to to counter that, and so I'm trying to understand why this five thousand figure is so important to you. Well, it is important because government obviously had has not kept pace with the increasing number of peoples who should be in school. So when you are not building and adding on to existing educational infrastructure, particularly in communities whose populations are growing, mm. this is what you have. Because the communities cannot wait. They know the value of education. And so invariably, many of them start mm. their own schools. And because we don't have the infrastructure, these schools are then classified as schools under, under trees. trees. So, so, so you're saying there's been a, there's been a retrogression of sort uh, if, we, if we comparatively looked at the uh, John Mahama era and the Nanado Nanko Ekufuado era uh, contextually uh, looking at uh, schools under trees. Yes, that is the point I am making. Okay. Yes. The other thing I want to uh, challenge you on, you say the figures you gave us about the number of schools that exist is from, from the budget. No, from Africa presented. Education Watch. No, no, not that one. Uh, the one about the number of kindergarten schools. That's correct. It's, it's based on the budget that, that is correct. this year. This, uh, is I mean, what the, this is what the ministry agency, okay. Ghana Education Service, okay. and presented so, to us. And, and the reason I'm saying I want to challenge you on that is that on the performance tracker, uh, the government says that it has 15,227 kindergarten schools. It goes on to say that it has... 15,622 uh, public schools. Uh, it, it does not give the JHS levels, uh, but obviously it's, it's very different from the figures that have been presented to you in Parliament. Well, then government has questions to answer because this is the report that was given to us by the Ghana Education Service when it appeared before the committee to justify its budget estimates for the current budget. And so these are the figures that we have officially, mm. where government has found the additional educational infrastructure and the additional schools. I mean, they will have to respond to that. I know they would watch, and then if they can justify that, so be it. But, but you must be curious as to why the numbers don't match. Well, yes, I am. But, but you see, <laughs> that is part of the problem that we have. In fact, if you allow me, just a week ago, the Ghana Education Service, as part of the agencies under the ministry, appeared before the committee in Kofrodia. And the figures they presented, as far as I know, are the same figures that I have as they presented to us during the budget. Mm. So to have the GES present figures to us in preparation for the budget, and the same figures repeated when GES appeared before the committee in Kofrodia, at variance with what is captured in the performance tracker. Now discredited performance tracker. Uh, I'm not surprised because we all know that the performance tracker leaves a lot more to be desired. So I would rather take what has been given to me in parliament mm. over what is in the performance tracker. The government introduced a new curriculum which took effect in September 2019. As part of the new curriculum, which the Christian standard-based curriculum. New textbooks were to be produced and distributed, which will make sense because once you've changed the curriculum, it will mean that the old textbooks are no longer tenable. 
So you have to make available to the people's new textbooks. As we are speaking, it is almost four years down the line. Only 65% of textbooks based on the new curriculum have been distributed. So clearly, there is a problem there. And this has implications. In fact, this is only for KG to primary six. Uh -huh. For our wards in the junior high school, where the change also had an effect, their version is not called the standard-based curriculum. It's called the common core curriculum. Not even one textbook has been produced. So as we speak, our wards who are going to write their BECE this year, from JHS 1 to JHS 3, they have not seen or used a textbook based on the change curriculum. So clearly, this so, is an issue. So what is the guidance for, of study and what are they measured on in the you know, end of uh, education exams like the BEC? Yeah, these are the legitimate questions that everyone is asking. In fact, we must commend our teachers for doing more than expected to keep teaching and learning going. But even the teachers will tell you that no teacher is a moving encyclopedia. And although the teachers will do their best, they also need a guide. And the students need their books so that when they go home, at least they can practice and learn what has been taught in class. This is not happening. And so these are some of the questions that we raise to make the case that this government has been paying lip service to education in general. And in fact, when it comes to basic education, I mean, the conclusion is that basic education has been sidelined, in many ways neglected, in favor of secondary education. Because, I mean, textbooks are provided free for students in secondary school. They even get free uniforms and free sports apparel. But when it comes to the basic schools, you've only provided 65%. And when it comes to the junior high schools, they are yet to even get any books based on the change curriculum. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. But what could be the implications of, of that to, of, on our children, on our basic education system? Clearly, it would impact teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Because when the teachers don't have their teacher's guide, and the pupils don't have the, the textbooks, core textbooks, mm -hmm. so they can follow what they are being taught, then it has implications for teaching and learning. And those implications, we would only get to know when the students write their BECE, and then we see the outcome. Well, my government has, has been very pleased by the outcomes. They have said that you know, the performances have improved over the years because of, again, uh, investments they are putting into improving teaching and learning. Uh, I mean, it, it makes it hard to reconcile the two positions. Well, government says what government wants to say. But, you know, we speak to parents. We speak to teachers. So we know the challenges. But the kids are coming out with good grades. Yes, but that is not because of government's effort. In fact, a lot of parents are spending more to get their wars through basic school because the cost is being shifted. I mean, we capitation grants. And these are the grants that allows us to say that public basic education is free in Ghana. As I speak, and I've spoken to various head teachers and the conference of heads of basic schools. Government owes capitation grants the equivalent of Eight terms. And these are the eight monies. Terms. Eight terms. Eight terms. And these are the monies that the heads of the basic schools use to procure chalk attendance registers, mm -hmm. to get carpenters to fix broken down doors and windows, to get masons to fix cracks, to procure items, and to undertake sporting and cultural activities. When was the last time you had basic schools engage in cultural activities or sporting activities? Because government is failing to remit capitation grants. So when you have a situation like this, clearly 
You cannot tell me that you are doing well as far as public basic education is concerned. And don't take it from me. Take it from Nat. Take it from Nagrad. Angel Kabonu has been on record indicating how the basic sector has practically been neglected. And these are facts. Again, I'll challenge you with government's performance tracker. It says since 2017, uh, and its source is the finance ministry. They have paid 248.5 million cities into the capitation grants or given it those monies out. Well, the number of beneficiaries, hang on, I'll let you make the point on that. The number of beneficiaries of capitation grants, uh, pupils that have benefited from the policy as of 2023 is 6 million. And some 7,500 schools have, have had feeding grants. I want us to look at the figure 6 million pupils um, who, as of 2023, have uh, benefited from capitation grants. When we take what you have said, that eight terms, we are looking at two academic years. That is correct. And, and a little more. It, it, again, it doesn't seem as though our figures align. Well, that is obvious because government has been engaged in a lot of deceit. I, I spoke to you earlier about the numbers. If we are to take only primary, according to government's own information given to us, we are speaking about 3.4 million. 3.4 million. Mm -hmm. And you quote how many to have benefited from capitation grants? Six million as of 2023. Well, that is wrong because the capitation grant is per year, per mm -hmm. annum. And it is calculated as 10 Ghana cities per people per year. Now, as a member of parliament, I can tell you that we have never refused to approve requested allocations. Mm -hmm for any segment of education. But the challenge is the remittance. So whilst it is indeed true that if you look at the budget, such quantums of monies have been requested mm -hmm. and have been approved, the problem is the disbursement. And I right. challenge government that the disbursements have not been done and government owes capitation grants the equivalent of eight times. So th these figures are not entirely true. They cannot so, be. So, so I want to look at the actual monies that have gone out to the schools. And again, uh, it's based on the fact that the teachers have sat here on the show and spoken about the fact that the capitation grants are not coming in. So government says 248.5 million cities have been invested to support foundational education since 2017. Uh, from what you know, how much have actually been disbursed? It will be difficult to tell because unless I compute from 2017 mm. to the present, but incidentally, I know the figures of the senior high school offhand mm -hmm. because of the very politicized nature of that segment. But right. in terms of the overall quantum of monies invested in basic education, it will be difficult to tell. But what I know is this, mm. that over the period, and you see, I am a politician. Government appointees, including the minister, they are politicians. So it is always better to rely on, on civil society organizations like Africa Education Watch, Institute for Educational Studies, and even the teacher unions themselves. Let me give you a quick rendition of what Africa Education Watch has indicated with regards to the matter of funding basic education. Uh -huh. And this is a memorandum of issues in the basic education sector, which was issued by Africa Education Watch, and copies were made available uh -huh. to us in Parliament. Item number 10, it says, poor financing of basic education. With your permission, I read, the access and quality deficits exposed above are primarily the result of poor financing of public basic education over the years. Since 2012, when 27% of the total national budget, the equivalent of 7% of GDP, was spent on education, the financing trend has declined to only 12% budgetary allocation in 2023, the equivalent of only 3% of GDP. This is in the face of growing economy and growing population. So it is clear 
from the Africa Education Watch report that whilst in 2012 we were spending 27%, as of 2023 we are spending only 12%, which is the equivalent of only 3% of GDP. Yeah. So the, this is Africa Education Watch. I see. Don't take it from me. Don't take it from your auditorium. Take it from Africa Education Watch. When we come back, I want us to look at that 10 CD uh, per student per annum capitation grant. Very right. well. Welcome back to Hot Issues. Today we're paying a special focus on Ghana's education sector. My guest is Bilsa South MP, Dr. Clement Apak. Doc, 10 cities per student per annum is what government gives uh, for capitation grants at the basic level. That is correct. What do you think about that? Well, first of all, I think that it is meager. It's insufficient when you factor in the current levels of inflation and the cost of almost every item, including educational supplies. But you see, the problem is not even about the fact that what 10 cities could buy three years ago, 10 cities cannot buy today. It is also about government's refusal. And in fact, the, the, the refusal of the Ministry of Finance to ensure that these grants are remitted timelessly. There is no reason why Parliament approves a request to finance public basic education. And yet the Ministry of Finance fails to remit the capitation grant as it should. And I think that is where the problem is. So whilst the amount, I would argue, is insufficient mm -hmm. given the times in which we find ourselves, what is even more worrisome is the fact that government is always owing as far as the competition grants are concerned. And look, this puts a lot of pressure on the managers of our public business schools. It is one of the reasons why many public business schools across the country look very shabby, dilapidated, and unattractive. Because when the competition grants are not available, how is the head teacher going to pay for the services of a carpenter to mm -hmm. fix broken down doors and windows? How is the head teacher going to pay for the services of a carpenter to fix broken down furniture? Mm -hmm. And how is the head teacher going to pay for the services of a mason? And, and, and we, 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 we are in serious trouble because now busy schools don't have the capacity because of this delay in the capitation grant mm -hmm. and, and its insufficiency to undertake sporting activities to undertake cultural activities. So the capitation grant is what makes public basic education a public service. Mm. Because it is not going, many parents, even as poor as they are, do whatever it, they can to enroll their awards in private schools. So, so Doc, what I worry about is if in 2024, it is 10 cities. Then I wonder what it was under the NDC. Was it any more than 10 cities? No, it wasn't 10 cities. Okay. It wasn't 10 cities. Uh -huh. In fact, it was five cities, uh -huh. as far as I remember. Uh -huh. But naturally, we ought to improve. So an increment, yes, is welcome. So this is where I'm going with that. What is the logic behind keeping the capitation grant, grant so low if basic education is important to us? Why? Well, that is a debate that we can have. But you, you must understand that the value is important because what five cities could do in 2016, I would argue that 10 cities cannot do even today. As a country, we must also find a way to sustainably fund our basic level education. What would be your suggestions? Well, I think that the issue is not about a lack of resources. The issue is about a lack of prioritizing what we speak about in flowery language. Because, for example, I would argue that let's be fair to, to all the three tiers of education. Mm -hmm. Why is it that we can find money to procure free uniforms, to procure free 
apparel, sports apparel, for our wards in secondary school. And yet, we cannot do the same for those in basic school. So it's about priority. So what we have said is that it is okay to invest in secondary education, but it is not right to then neglect basic education. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it is a lack of resources. I think it is a lack of prioritizing basic education. And this is one of the challenges that we have with regards to the way government has tended to focus more and to allocate more resources to secondary education to the detriment, I would argue, mm. of basic education. So I'll rephrase. What, what, because again, and, and the reason I want to rephrase the question is because it would appear uh, that the uh, NDC is it's very focused on basic level education. It's something that the flag bearer, John Ramani Mahama, has also said that they will focus on basic education and review the senior high school, the free senior high school policy. So my question is, uh, what will be the alternative you are offering the Ghanaian people if or when um, the uh, John and Jane ticket uh, makes it to the Jubilee House? Well, as you indicated earlier, the flag bearer of the NDC has said it on many occasions. In fact, I had the opportunity to sit in meetings uh, with him when he interacted with uh, various groups in the educational sector. And he has never missed words uh, in indicating that he's going to prioritize basic education. Prioritizing basic education simply would mean that he would ensure that the capitation grant is remitted timelessly. He would address the issue of furniture shortage. As we speak now, we have a furniture deficit in excess of one million. What that means is that about one million of our wards mm -hmm. go to school every day and they have to sit on the floor or lie on the floor or sit on blocks to study. And that clearly cannot be acceptable. The other area where we are going to focus is that we have so many schools which are only primary one to primary six mm -hmm. without junior high schools. And this is happening in many rural communities, including mine. And what this then means is that when the children go from P1 to P6, because there are no transitional junior high schools in their immediate communities, where sometimes they have to trek and walk for 15 to 20 kilometers to access junior high school, their education is truncated after primary six. And so we are going to address all of this, including a robust effort to eliminate the over 5,000 schools and the trees. So when the NDC flag bearer speaks about prioritizing basic education, mm -hmm. what he means is that he is going to address the current challenges and to ensure that the budgetary allocation to basic education, which has been dwindling over time since this government took over the governance of this country, is stopped and increased. Oh, I see. Let's talk about free senior high school now. We spent quite a bit on uh, basic level education. And basic education is important because it's foundational. So I am glad that we are speaking a lot about basic education because you cannot pretend to build a structure which is secondary and a superstructure which is tertiary on a weak, feeble, and wobbly basic educational system. Very well. On free senior high school, uh, the conversation from the opposition side of government is that we will review the free senior high school. What exactly are you reviewing? Well, everyone knows that in policy formulation and implementation, when you begin to implement the policy, at the very minimum, by the third, fourth year, you should conduct a review. And if you were to look at the definition of a review, a review is simply a formal assessment of a policy or a program to identify where it has done well and where it has not done well with the intent of improving it. That is what a review is. So when we talk about a review, that is what we mean. Now, a review would happen, and a review has been called for. 
In fact, I can tell you that except government, almost every other stakeholder in the Republic of Ghana, from teacher unions to religious groups to, if you like, former vice chancellors, former directors of education, former ministers of education, everyone agrees uh -huh. that having implemented the program close to a decade, to quote the Minister for Education, the call for a review is justified. In fact, it is even long overdue. John Dorman and Mama and the NDC, we have said that, look, the free senior school policy is a good policy. Mm -hmm. After all, it is born of the Constitution. We started implementing it. Oh, did you? Oh, yes, we did. How? In fact, the current president is even on record to have commended John Dorman and Mama for beginning the implementation of the free senior high school when we started the progressively free senior high school policy. And that's not how I remember no. it. Yes, yes. In fact, he is on, on, on record. And I, I can challenge you to that. In fact, he granted an interview to Fifi Boafo, who was then a journalist with uh, a media network. And he said that better late than never. And that he was happy to know that John Ramani Mama had started implementing the free senior school policy. I hear what you say. What Rightly I want so. to understand is how had you started it, uh, it, it within the period that John Romani Mahama was in power? We have started it by taking some of the cost elements. The state had taken some of the cost elements, like, you know, the fees that the students were expected to pay. We are taking 11 of them. And for the day students, they had begun having it free of charge. But we had argued that before we roll out the full scale free as we now know it, we had to do some work. We had to augment existing educational infrastructure in terms of, in terms of residential infrastructure and academic infrastructure. You remember we had even started the building of the e-blocks we, yeah, we completed, that, that I remember, we completed the 46. Of the e -block. Yes, that was part of it. I, and in fact, the first e block was actually commissioned. A number of them were in use, including the one in the hometown of our late former president, Professor John Evans Atta Mills. So we had started. And don't take it from me, I've given you a source. Fifi Boafo, at the time, who was then a journalist, and I believe Oman FM had interviewed the, the current the, president, and he had admitted the, the, that... The source, I'm not sure, would ask... I, and again, no, I no, you can Google speak, it. It's speak, online. No, hang on. I don't speak, <laughs> I don't speak for uh, the source you have quoted, but I do not believe that the source will say the same at, at this time. Well, but, so, 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 that, it so is, it so is documented, why. and there's, it, it, there's documentary evidence, courtesy of the internet. If you Google it, you will find it. Th but that's why... A lot of media portals even picked it up, and I can send it to you. But you see, let's come back to the current debate. Indeed. We've moved the debate past the policy. The issue is now about the implementation challenges and how to deal with them. And we have said that the only way to deal holistically with the implementation challenges is a review. And that review would be initiated. The first step is going to involve the bringing together of stakeholders to constitute a national stakeholders forum. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring the teachers, we'll bring the students, we'll bring you guys from, from the media. Everybody should have room to contribute, to speak about what is going on within the context of the current implementation of the policy that needs to be addressed. But even within that context, as we wait, mm. the flag bearer of the NDC has thrown up some ideas mm -hmm. about some of the areas that he would also be proposing as part of the review process. For example, we have spoken about the feeding arrangements of the students, and we know that is a big problem. This current arrangement where the food supply system is centralized and is given to the National Food Buffer Stock Company, which then gives contracts to suppliers to supply food 
to the schools. It's a problem. One, we know that some of scrupulous suppliers have shortchanged the students by supplying less than what they have been allocated to supply. We have instances where suppliers are expected to supply, say, 50 bags of beans mm -hmm. and 50 bags of gari, and they supply just about 25 bags of gari and 25 bags of beans, clearly shortchanging the schools. We also have instances where the quality of the food that is supplied is unwholesome, and don't take it from me. Right. If we were to look at the PIAC monitoring report mm -hmm. of the implementation of the Fish National School Policy 2018-2019, PIAC indicated very clearly that not only has the feeding arrangements and the way it has been centralized become a conduit for large-scale corruption, but unwholesome food items such as weevil-infested flour, expired toma tin tomatoes, among others, have been supplied to our schools. So John Daman and Mama and the NDC has said that. What we would do as part of the review is to revert to the old arrangement where the feeding grant would go to the heads and managers of the secondary schools. They would then constitute their own arrangements and identify their own suppliers, as we used to do in the past. Mm -hmm. So the headmaster, the bezer, the matron, the Dano Hall prefect, the Dano Hall master, they sit together, they draw a menu, and based on that, they identify their own suppliers right. in their own community. So that is one example of what we would do if we get the opportunity to constitute government and to bring together the National Stakeholders Forum. We will table this, and I believe that as has already been accepted mm -hmm. by Nagrat, by Charles, and others in the educational sector. This is something that would help to improve the conditions as far as the delivery of the policy is concerned. Will the NDC keep it free? Yes, we will keep it free. For all students? We have said that and we will say it again. For all students? Yes. Isn't that, is, isn't that uh, you know, one of the arms of the problem of the implementation of the free senior high school policy? Well, until otherwise. And we don't want to decide the future of the policy. So... If well, you plan to improve it. The National Stakeholders Forum decides that, look, as a nation, let's keep it the way it is and let's find a sustainable way of funding. And different groups and entities and individuals have thrown up some ideas. Mm -hmm. I've heard, for example, some suggest that we could look at a levy targeted at funding the policy the way it is. Some have also said that let's allow parents to participate in the delivery by taking up some of the cost elements, for example. But all these are ideas. So until we constitute the National Stakeholders Forum for Ghana as a nation to decide the way forward, we would only be obligated to continue with what we are going to inherit. Right, so uh, I get it. But because I was going to ask you um, whether or not you, you have thought of a better way to fund the free senior high school policy, if it remains the way it is? Well, you see, in the wisdom of the flag bearer of the NDC, he understands that this is a national policy. And he understands that to deal with it in terms of what ought to be done to improve it, he has his own ideas. But it has to take a stakeholders forum mm -hmm. for us to decide. Because that is what you do. You get the buy-in of the population. You get the buy-in of all stakeholders. I, and together, I, no, I had, I we move that. forward. I had that. But, you know, the, 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 the problem with funding of the free senior high school policy is not because of a lack of a, a stakeholder consultation, as it is now. It's not because of that. And so, I mean, if you were to give alternative ways to fund the free senior high school policy, what would those alternative, uh, you know, alternatives be? Well, we, we haven't stated that position because we believe it's a, it's a position that should be made collectively. Right. Okay. That, that is the point I am making. Okay. Because Ghanaians have become used to the policy being delivered in a particular way. Mm. So if you are going to make changes well, as part of a review, you ought to seek the input of the beneficiaries to guide yes. the way forward. But 
that is different from matters to do with the food, for example, which is very obvious, and we know the challenges. So with that, we can make a definite pronouncement of how we want to rearrange and change the but dynamics then, but then, as far as the food arrangements are concerned. But and, then and if, they, you they, they, argument, they, they, if you make that argument, then it will sound as though you haven't figured out yet what the funding problem is. No, we do. You have. We, we have, but we don't want to jump the gun. We want Ghanaians to tell us we hope so. how they want it to be done because it, it is their resources. It is the words of Ghanaians. But you see, coming back to the, the issue of review, mm -hmm. do you know that the current government, in spite of suggesting that review means cancel, in the face of the clarion call by all stakeholders, has actually admitted to the IMF that it will review and rationalize mm -hmm. the free senior high school policy. Are you aware of that? Mm -hmm. And is that not hypocrisy of the highest order? The same government that tells us that the program doesn't require a review. It only requires an improvement, as recently re-echoed by the flag bearer of the MPP, uh, Dr. Mahmoud Baumia, when he was presenting quote unquote, his bold solutions, which I doubt, was the highest government official to have interacted with the IMF. And if you were to look at the review report, which came out in January this year, paragraph 47 on page 76, the test centers, it says, in the education sector, we will review and rationalize the free senior high school program. So you see, when we speak about the MPP being deceitful, being dishonest, not willing to tell Ghanaians the truth, not willing to do what Ghanaians want them to do, this is a classic example. Right. Former President John Dramani Mahama mentioned about the free senior high school. Now he says that the policy implementation will be moved from the Secretariat, which sits with the Ministry of Education, to the Ghana Education Service. What difference would that make? Why is that important? It will make a huge difference because, first of all, it is a duplication of responsibilities. Mm. Now, remember that initially, the Free Senior High School Secretariat was housed at the presidency. Mm -hmm. And then it was moved to the Ministry of Education as its own unit. Why would you have the Ghana Education Service, which is the agency under the Ministry of Education, with oversight responsibilities over pre-tertiary education, and at the same time, have a separate unit with oversight responsibilities over secondary education. It doesn't make sense. Prioritizing it, perhaps? It doesn't make sense. There is no reason to. In fact, I would argue that there is no reason for us to continue referring to secondary education in Ghana at Free Senior High School, which secondary institution, public, in Ghana is not part of the current arrangement. So John Mama is right. It is a duplication of responsibilities. It is a waste of resources. So let's consolidate. Let's put secondary education where it belongs because some aspects of secondary education are still under the Ghana Education Service and other aspects are under the Free Senior High School Secretariat. It simply does not make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that is part of the problem, affecting mm -hmm. the smooth implementation of the policy. And, and, and I'm hoping you can dig a bit further into that, because if it is a matter of nomenclature, that instead of being here, you are here, and, and things are OK, then I don't see why we should be in a hurry to move it from it being a secretariat to under the Ghana Education Service, which already has too much on its hand, you know, and, and I do not want to go there. But well, but things are not going well. And in any case, why are we duplicating and wasting more public resources? Because the secretariat is a fully staffed secretariat, and they receive a monthly salary. Mm. I would argue that the monies that should go to pay those who are manning the secretariat actually should be used to procure furniture. That would be a better use of public resources. So clearly, there is no justification for duplication of functions.
And I think that the call is justified and has been well received by players in the education sector. But this issue of furniture, you have brought it up again. So I'm tempted to go back to the performance tracker and see what government says about furniture. Please do. Don't go away. Welcome back to Hot Issues. My guest tonight is Dr. Clement Apak. He is a Bulsa South MP. You've spoken a lot, Doc, about furniture. Yes. But government has done uh, some 51,508 um, furnishings, if you like, uh, since that amount of furniture round to basic schools as of 2023. 2023. And so, the furniture you are talking about, they have sent it around. Well, the problem is that this is woefully inadequate. In fact, it is a drop in the ocean. When you consider the fact that, according to Africa Education Watch, between 2017 and 2021, the, the number of people with a desk mm -hmm. had increased from 30% to 40%. And this translated to 2.3 million people. 2.3 million. million. So when you have KG alone uh -huh. with 1.3 million people, and you have primary, one to six, 3.4 million people, and you have junior high school, 1.4 million people, and you provide less than 60 thousand pieces mm -hmm. of furniture that was for last year alone we do not have the uh, you know the benefits of the uh, last seven years yeah so, but i, so I just quoted last six years sorry i just quoted africa education watch uh -huh. where it speaks about the furniture deficit between 2017 and 2021 right and he said that the furniture deficit had increased from 30 to 40 percent between that period and that, that translated to 2.3 million people with their furniture. Right. So, so granting that government was even doing 100,000 pieces based on what we have seen, I'm being generous. Because 2023, they claim to have done just about 57,000 pieces, if I'm right, from what you quoted. Mm -hmm. So let's say we double it for the years between 2021 20, and present. And you look at the numbers that we are speaking about. That is still a drop in the ocean. So, uh, that is why you go to schools even today. And the they, they, they kids are lying on the, on the floor, mm -hmm. sitting on blocks, mm -hmm. lying on their bellies so, so, so to though, learn. A, 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 again, these numbers didn't just spring up in 2017. It's also a reflection of what was left behind, uh, which brings me to the question. So, I mean, wh what was different? when the NDC was in power? Because the 2.3 million students who don't have furniture didn't come up only between 2017 and... Uh, uh, yes. It is only fair to admit that these challenges existed. And of course, as I said earlier, every government works to address them. But it becomes an issue when you see the challenges magnifying and becoming exas exacerbated. Now, I just quoted Africa Education World that it had increased from a previous lower level to a higher level. And you see, this has become an issue of debate because of government's posturing, pretending as though it has done wonderfully well and ought to be applauded, when in fact the facts on the ground do not support the rhetoric. So I am not saying that we didn't have challenges in the past. What I am saying is that the rhetoric is not commensurate with what we see on the ground. Mm. And that is the case that I am making. And mm. we elect governments to improve conditions. So when a government takes over the reins of governance and conditions are deteriorating, clearly it's, a, it's an indication that the government is not doing well. What, are, what could be the solution to this problem, uh, given the current state of our peers as a country? Look, I would argue that it's an issue of prioritization. For example, look at the quantum of money state 
and public resources invested towards the construction of the National Cathedral. If those monies were to be applied to procure furniture, I believe that we would have been talking about millions of pieces of furniture procured and distributed. But the president and his government prioritized the construction of the cathedral, which has been described now as the most expensive hole on the surface of the earth. Another example, government said it was going to construct a port, the Keta port. Do you know that a CEO and a staff have been appointed since 2017, have been receiving salary, and yet not even a single block has been laid? Another example, not long ago, our president was hopping from one European metropolis to one American state in a chartered flight paying in excess of $18,000 an hour. He repented from that. But what I'm saying is that all these resources and the way they are being applied, if it was a John Mama NDC government, we will be applying these resources in where they are most needed, in the area of education and the procurement of furniture. And I can give you so many other examples where this government has applied public resources in projects and areas that do not benefit the people of this country. Mm. One good thing, perhaps, that the uh, current administration has done is uh, the one laptop per student, uh, one tablet, uh, excuse me, per student policy. And um, even that, which the NDC couldn't do during this time, you are still opposed to it. Well, it's not that the NDC couldn't do. If you remember, the NDC had started that. But you see, let's put things in perspective. And as an old vandal, the motto of our whole is truth stands. Mm -hmm. In the wake of COVID, the NDC, in its 2020 manifesto, also indicated that it would provide free tablets mm -hmm. with educational content to students and teachers. We said that. The MPP had also said the same in their 2020 manifesto. In fact, they had indicated that discussions were ongoing towards the provision of free tablets and free, free tablets for junior high school and senior high school students. I was going to look for a copy of their manifesto, but I've memorized it. Mm. If you see their manifesto for 2020, page 57, promise number 123. So they said they were going to provide free tablets to junior high school and senior high school students. Down the line, they have now decided to attempt fulfilling a campaign promise that they made in 2020. We don't have a problem with this in principle, but the timing, an election year, with all the other challenges that the same students who are going to be beneficiaries of this one tablet face, it became obvious to us that this was being done as a way of enticing students to believe that those of them who would have attained voting age should cast their vote for the MPP. How is that? Well, it is obvious because I've spoke, spoken about the timing and I've spoken about the fact that the original promise was to make them available to junior high schools and senior high schools. Mm -hmm. Have you heard them speak to the fact? And I know many viewers are not even aware. And I've referred you to page 57 of the MPP 2020 manifesto, mm -hmm. promise number 123. Why have they chosen 
not to make them available to the students in the junior high school. Eventually, Do you know why? Eventually, because even for the senior high school, so students, we would not, say not start, everybody is getting. Why don't you start from below and come up? Shouldn't they learn how to use these tablets with educational content at the junior high school level before they get to the senior high school level? So, the reason is simple. The junior high school students would not be voting age. They won't be able to register and vote. Do we see this policy continued? Well, as I said, we have said that we will do similar. Mm. But you see, even within the current arrangement, we have in excess of 1.3 million students in secondary school. We have in excess of 1.4 million students in junior high school. I can tell you, as a member of the Education Committee of Parliament, and in fact, I am the deputy ranking member, government has only procured and paid for 450,000 pieces. Not 1 million, mm -hmm. not 1.3 million. And when we asked how you are going to distribute this, the minister is here to tell us how it is going to be done. We are now being told that it is going to be on a pilot basis. When we asked the criteria for selecting the schools that are going to be the initial beneficiaries of the tablets, we are here to be told. So we have served a caution and called attention to the fact that although this is a half-hearted way of fulfilling a manifesto promise intended to hoodwink unsuspecting students to register and vote for the MPP, and we know these students are wiser and would not be hoodwinked, we want to sound alarm and caution that should the selection of the initial schools be based on political expediency, I see. we are going to fight back because the lab the laptops or tablets uh -huh. are not being procured and paid for by personal resources of I, the minister I, I, I or I the mean, NDC, uh, MPP flag bearer. That's, that's, that's quite a stretch, but we'll wait and see yes. how things play out. Thank you for coming. You are welcome. My guest today has been a deputy ranking member on Parliament's Education Committee. He's also Bill South MP. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover all grounds, but we hope that our conversation today has put the... Uh, needed spotlights on key issues on Ghana's education sector, particularly at the uh, pre-tertiary level, uh, basic education, senior high school education. I am Kemeni Amana. I'll see you here same time next week. Bye-bye.